Okay, so today we're going to be talking about post-exertional malaise as it uh, relates to ME-CFS and to post-viral syndromes. So what really is post-exertional malaise? This is a unique and pathognomonic finding really for ME-CFS, what we've been taking care of in our post-viral illnesses for a very long time. And it's not known to exist in any other illnesses, including those suffering from post-chemotherapy complications, or even in the most decompensated of individuals, people who have been in the ICU for three straight months in a coma. Um, they don't exactly experience post-exertional malaise even when fatigue is profound. Um, we are recognizing post-exertional malaise in post-acute sequelae of COVID as well. And as aforementioned, that may be because many cases, though not all, of post-acute sequelae of COVID look like the early stages of ME-CFS just triggered by COVID-19 rather than some other pathogen or trigger. So the Institute of Medicine um, worked really hard to use evidence-based criteria to come up with a definition for post-exertional malaise back in 2015, given that it's such an important part of understanding ME-CFS and post-viral illnesses. And they defined it as the inability to recover normally following physical, cognitive, or emotional exertion, resulting in a level of fatigue that is more profound, more devastating, and longer lasting than is observed in patients with any other fatiguing disorders. So this fatigue is accompanied by a profound loss in stamina, a reduction in functional capacity or ability to do things, and significantly augmented symptoms uh, that people are already experiencing on their normal days in ME-CFS or in post-acute sequelae of COVID pathology. And this can include worsening of their autonomic dysfunction symptoms, reduced metabolic efficiency, dysfunction of their immune system, and even perturbations of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Some augmented symptoms that people describe in post-exertional malaise include things like flu-like symptoms where they experience either subjective or objective fevers, sore throats, arthralgias, myalgias, um, cognitive symptoms like the onset of brain fog, uh, difficulty with finding the right words to use, reduced concentration and focus. They can see insomnia, increase in headaches, increase in sensory sensitivities to light, to sound, uh, to multiple sensory inputs coming in at once, uh, and also augmented symptoms of orthostatic intolerance or the inability, or I should say the ability to remain upright without a worsening of their overall functional status. So what is the PEM experience like? It is not uncommon for people who are experiencing post-exertional malaise to remain confined to bed for much of the duration of their episode. And it's not that they have to be, but when it's bad, they often are. They may actually struggle to complete basic activities of daily living, including things like toileting or preparing food. It sometimes is the most they can do during a post-exertional malaise episode to complete those tasks. And then I have a quote here from a patient that I thought was really enlightening. And that is, on my normal days when I'm feeling sick, if the house is on fire, I can get out of the house. I'm not gonna feel good, it's gonna cause pain, but I can, I can get out. When I'm in my bad post-exertional malaise, I'm not sure I can make it out in time. It's that debilitating and it's not just a collection of symptoms, but there's a true inability um, despite imminent danger to actually function. So what triggers PEM? How do people end up experiencing post-exertional malaise? Well. We know that exercise or physical exertion can trigger it, as can orthostatic stress, spending time upright as compared to sitting with your legs elevated or laying down, cognitive or mental activities, environmental stressors, which can include, again, bright lights, loud sounds, multiple visual inputs, like when you're on I-15 on the highway and there's traffic all around you, or maybe you're at a jazz game, uh, chemical exposures, the smell of tobacco smoke, the smell of pine saw, um, cleaning solutions, et cetera, um, and even emotional responses, be those positive or negative emotions, can all be triggers for PEM. So in a lot of ways, just existing in the world is a risk factor for this. In those who are more severely ill with ME-CFS or with post-acute sequelae of COVID or other post-viral illnesses, um, 
this uh, PEM episode can be triggered by very minor exertions, such as reading a book, using a computer or staring at a computer or phone screen, having improvisational conversations, showering, or even sitting up to eat a meal. Trying to get the visual out here. Excuse me for one second. Okay, so how how long does PEM last? So PEM um, comes in a range of durations for people. And there was a, a survey in 2018 with 150 individuals with MECFS, and over 90% of these individuals clearly recognized what we call bad days that are worse than their baseline function or their quote unquote good days. Um, and those bad days were consistent with our definitions for post-exertional malaise. So the duration of PEM episodes varied widely among different individuals, depending on how sick they were, but it also varied among individuals, depending on the degree of exertion that triggered their episode of post-exertional malaise. So uh, as you can see here, I would say that the majority of episodes of post-exertional malaise, shortest duration and longest duration, by the way, is the shortest duration of PEM or the longest duration of PEM um, mentioned by any particular individual. But you can see here that the most of them are clustered anywhere from less than 24 hours up to three to seven days. So it really does depend on the severity of illness in any individual and also in how much was done, how much exertion or energy was spent uh, that actually triggered that episode of post-exertional malaise. And then what is the range of time to onset of post-exertional malaise? This goes to our second question about how quickly after uh, an exertional episode can people experience PEM. So expert clinicians almost universally agree that post-exertional malaise onset is delayed by 24 to 48 hours after an inciting event. And that's where it is so unique compared to other fatiguing illnesses. However, as you can see in, uh, in this same survey, patients often believe that their symptoms begin immediately after inciting events, which only makes things more confusing. This discrepancy in patient reporting is likely the consequence of the physiological impact of orthostatic intolerance that occurs immediately after a taxing physical or cognitive task and affects how a patient feels and causes them to need to rest. So if I go out and I mow the lawn, I may feel lightheaded and dizzy and weak and exhausted from that uh, episode. And I may need to go rest because of other aspects of my post-viral illness, but post-exertional malaise wouldn't be until perhaps later that evening or the following day, or even 36 to 48 hours later, when all of a sudden now I can't really get out of bed. I can't shower. It takes all my energy just to microwave one meal for that day and to let the dog out to go to the bathroom. So good clinical history is critical in identifying post-exertional malaise among your patients. So is post-exertional malaise, can it be equilibrated to debt in an analogy? Um, and sometimes we do say that a way to think about post-exertional malaise for patients is to think that they have $1 a day to spend on energy. And if uh, they stay within that spending limit, if they spend 90 cents a day or 70 cents a day on exertional tasks, be they cognitive, emotional, or physical, they don't have any worsening of their acute baseline dysfunction. However, if they go on a spending spree and spend $10 all in one day, they may get hit really hard with post-exertional malaise shortly thereafter. But where it gets even more confusing is that people can sometimes get away with spending maybe $1.25 every day or most days of a week without feeling the impact of post-exertional malaise until several days later. And then all of a sudden, all that debt needs to be paid back and often with interest. So it's not always easy for people to identify what their exact trigger for post-exertional malaise is, although sometimes it is very easy. So how do we actually assess this on a more scientific basis? Um, well, cardiopulmonary exercise testing has been a really important tool in assessing post-exertional malaise. It's a validated tool used for the assessment of functional capacity among healthy people and among people with debilitating and fatiguing illnesses. And it's been used um, as a surrogate marker or, or endpoint marker for all kinds of different um, studies. 
This cardiopulmonary exercise testing helps uh, or assesses the coordinated contributions of metabolic, cardiovascular, respiratory, and muscular inputs to generation of energy. Where CPET testing is helpful in post-exertional malaise is when we do that two days in a row, or what we call serial two-day cardiopulmonary exercise testing. It's reliable, it's reproducible, and can accurately measure post-exertional malaise. So in general, uh, in general, healthy individuals have a very low variability in the differences between one day and the next day in CPAP testing. Um, and that's also true of people with other chronic impairing illnesses like COPD, uh, congestive heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, cystic fibrosis, and pulmonary hypertension. However, ME-CFS patients are unique in that they cannot reproduce CPET outcome measures on the second day of testing after a first day of exertional exercise testing. And this is con considered to be independent of effort, which we can account for uh, in appropriate CPET protocols. So CPET testing is particularly effective for measuring what we call the peak oxygen consumption or VO2 peak during exercise. And this is a well-recognized indicator of functional capacity um, and is a surrogate marker for the maximum energy available for work. And we see all kinds of deficits in serial two-day CPET testing. Here you can see that the peak VO2 uh, cannot be reproduced in those with CFS. Uh, compared to those who are healthy uh, in the control group or who have other chronic fatiguing illnesses. We also note that people are unable to reach their ventilatory threshold to achieve peak workload or, and are unable to duplicate workload at ventilatory threshold compared to day one. So there's very clear differences in our ME-CFS population or other post-viral illnesses compared to other fatiguing illnesses and those with uh, those who are healthy. CPET testing is also effective for measuring what we call the ventilatory anaerobic threshold as a function of increases in muscle and blood pH, as well as in lactate and carbon dioxide concentrations. And this ventilatory anaerobic threshold is considered a reliable marker for detecting a patient's anaerobic threshold upon a physiological exertional task. And CPET testing has demonstrated notable reductions in ventilatory anaerobic threshold in those with ME-CFS, suggesting that they have a reduced capacity to maintain aerobic or oxygen-based metabolism before they switch to engaging in compensatory, less efficient anaerobic methods of ATP generation. And as you may remember, uh, anaerobic um, metabolism does not generate nearly as many ATP as aerobic metabolism does. So here is, is from a, a similar study where we have symptoms of post-exertional malaise reported both before and then after a uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test. And we have um, the control patients here in blue and the CFS patients in red. And the different uh, shades of color represent immediately uh, post-exercise or post-CPET testing. Uh, 24 and 48 hours, I'm sorry, 48 and 72 hours after that exercise testing. And so you can see if you just kind of stare at the blue lines here, there can be some symptoms of fatigue, maybe a little muscle and joint pain, maybe a little bit of weakness and trembling that resolve pretty quickly in controls after CPET testing. But when you look at the CFS patients, you often will see persistence of symptoms for multiple days on end. Um, and sometimes symptoms even get worse, such as fatigue, uh, lightheadedness and vertigo, muscular and joint pain actually gets worse farther out from uh, the CPET testing. Cognitive dysfunction can get worse farther out, headaches, etc. So it's a very different clinical picture as well as a metabolic picture there. So is there really altered cellular metabolism in post-exertional malaise? So if one considers the impact of impaired cellular metabolism and reduced ATP production, or utilization upon skeletal, upon cardiac, vascular, and GI smooth muscle, and if you consider the impact of reduced ATP production or utilization upon gray and white matter of the central and peripheral nervous systems, the varied and diverse symptoms of post-exertional malaise that we were talking about at the beginning of this lecture become a little less confusing, right? If there's not energy to support all these different functions, it's not surprising that they can have such a wide range of exacerbations of symptoms. 
here we have a gene expression study where there was a another um, cardiopulmonary exercise test or an exertional exercise test and gene expression as a function of measured levels of mRNA production um, was evaluated after this exercise challenge. Gene expression remained mostly similar across control groups and across a comparator group with multiple sclerosis after an exercise challenge. However, those with ME-CFS demonstrated elevated mRNA expression for alpha-2 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors, as well as interleukin-10 and purogenic 2X4 receptors in the post-exercise period. And you can kind of see in this visual here, it's obviously a little crowded, but this is our comparator group. And then these are our patients with ME-CFS or post-viral illnesses. There's a huge increase across all of these different domains in mRNA expression after exercise. A similarly structured study suggested that the magnitude of increases in gene expression in response to an exercise challenge track directly with the severity of symptoms reported by those with ME-CFS in the post-exercise interval. In other words, the, uh, the sicker people felt after an exercise challenge, the more likely they were to have excessive mRNA expression. And this is, I don't know why this is uh, listed this way, but we're actually moving towards greater severity as we move here towards that, uh, that axis. Um, and so you can see more mRNA expression, the more severe the symptoms were after a uh, exercise challenge. There was yet another follow-up study that tracked the most statistically significant post-exercise gene expression receptors against patient reported symptoms of pain, fatigue, mood, and confusion in order to try to correlate the levels of gene expression with these symptoms. And the largest increases in post-exercise transcription of receptor mRNA were found specifically in alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, again, likely involved in things like orthostatic intolerance and, and autonomic function, as well as in glucocorticoid NR 3C1 receptors. They also detected a correlation between the expression of NR3C1 glucocorticoid receptors and the overall severity of symptom exacerbation during post-exertional malaise. And so it's hypothesized that the receptor, this NR3C1 glucocorticoid receptors upregulation during post-exertional malaise might be altering people's sensitivity to cortisol during this time period, although we do need more research to sort of elucidate those finer points. There are also neurobiological changes that we experience in post-exertional malaise. So patients with ME-CFS and controls with similarly matched physiological responses to exercise, so decompensated controls in ME-CFS patients, as well as maybe more compensated patients, were asked to perform both pre-exercise and post-exercise uh, PASAT cognitive tasks. This is a paste auditory serial task edition um, that has been used in several different studies to assess cognitive function after a challenge. Healthy controls actually showed improvements in their ability to perform these cognitive tasks with less mistakes after exercise. And this is suggestive of learned task improvements. You can see here uh, less mistakes over the uh, time period of uh, pre-exercise and post-exercise and those gray bars for the controls. Whereas those with ME-CFS actually made more errors, especially in the post-exercise period and experienced a decrement in performance after exercise. So something might be going on here with their cognitive function as well. In that same study, the decline in PASAT performance was accompanied by significant increases in post-exercise brain activity, most notably in the inferior and superior parietal and singular cortices. And the magnitude of changes in brain activity in this post-exercise state directly correlated with the number and magnitude of patient-reported PEM symptoms in the days following that exertional challenge. So could these detrimental neurophysiological uh, consequences be the result of what we call neuroinflammation? And I think this is important to define here. This is not like when you uh, get cerebrospinal fluid and look for lymphocytes in it, right? This type of neuroinflammation is defined by microglial cells moving from a resting state to a pro-inflammatory state. And this is associated with structural changes and with functional adaptations, including release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
the presence of these cytokines in specific regions of the brain can lead to what we sometimes refer to as the sickness response, which has been associated with symptoms of heavy fatigue, brain fog, confusion, malaise, and low motivation. In healthy individuals, microglial changes occur transiently with things like active infection, but they rapidly recover to their resting state. And in fact, there have been experiments where they inject lipopolysaccharide into brain tissue and induce these changes in microglial cells. That's to kind of mimic as if there was a bacterial infection there, but they will eventually clear the lipopolysaccharide and, and return to normal. However, in MECFS, there is evidence suggesting that the microglial cells are more easily or abnormally activated and either appear stuck in an activated state or they flip back and forth between activated and inactivated very quickly. So we actually use MR spectroscopy, at least in the research realm, though not in the clinical realm quite yet, to quantify metabolites of neuroinflammation within the brains of those with MECFS. And a lot of different interesting findings have been noted, including lactate, being found at levels four times greater than that in controls in the ventricles, the corpus callosum, the occipital cortex, and probably most importantly, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is right in this region right here of the brain. And it's a region that is intimately tied to the sickness response, to feelings of malaise, and to feelings of depressed mood. And it's important to note that brain lactate rarely becomes elevated and only does so when neurons run completely out of glucose and when astrocytes instead begin to produce lactate as an alternative energy source. So this is usually only seen in things like malignancy or significant vascular pathology. Uh, in my rheumatology days, I would see this in CNS vasculitis, for example. There's also been note of choline, which is a marker for high neuronal cell turnover that is elevated in the left anterior cingulate cortex of those with MECFS. And uh, another technique that I can't quite fully explain not being a radiologist or a researcher called brain thermometry. This is a technique that is used to assess areas of the brain under excessive metabolic demand. It shows that the degree of temperature can be one degree Fahrenheit hotter than the surrounding brain areas in those same locations where choline and lactate are elevated in our MECFS patients. So there is something about these regions of the brain that is absolutely not normal in our MECFS patients. They've also used PET scans to measure radio labeled isotope ligands to what's called the TSPO protein or the translocator protein. And this is a micro, microglial cell receptor protein and its expression is magnified when microglia enter their activated and cytokine releasing state. And we've noted with the PET scans that elevated TSPO levels have been observed in the thalamus, in the cingulate cortex and in the hippocampus of those with MECFS. These, have all, uh, these areas have all been implicated in other MR spectroscopy metabolic studies as well. Um, so this is, this is pretty, uh, to me, rather convincing evidence that something is not right in the brains of, of these individuals. And we do have active studies underway to determine if there are major discrepancies in these metabolic markers in the lactate and the choline in the TSPO um, receptor protein uh, expression. Um, within the same individual, right? Are there differences in their expression in a pre-exercise versus a post-exercise state for PEM specifically? Uh, or what is what we're detecting here just PEM in a lot of individuals who are sick and don't know how to manage or avoid PEM? Or is it um, something that's present in, in the brains of those with MECFS and post-viral illnesses? Normally, we're still trying to elucidate that. However, um, we do have some other neurologic, neurobiological activities that we know are unique to post-exertional malaise specifically. So there are another type of neuroimaging scan called blood oxygenation level dependent scans or BOLD scans. And these have been performed at rest and after exercise challenge in our MECFS patients to evaluate clustered neuronal networks that activate at the same time and together and appear to be part of a processing unit. So several areas of the brain may all activate and work together for certain tasks in this case. And there is strikingly elevated activity detected in what's called the medial prefrontal cortex. And this is, the, uh, this is an anterior node of what's called the default mode network. Um, but there's elevated activity in the anterior node of this network um, compared to, you know, in post-exercise periods compared to pre-exercise, um, though this region is not showing elevated activity levels in uh, control subjects when uh, exposed to exercise. So all regions of the default mode network 
except this anterior node of the medial prefrontal cortex actually have a lower resting state in ME-CFS compared to controls before exercise. So they're starting from a lower level and then this anterior node is getting way more activated after exercise compared to controls. It's also important to note that controls had higher uh, bold signals suggesting reduced global cerebral blood flow in ME-CFS compared to controls. But what is the DMN? So the DMN is a collection of brain regions with correlated activation. So all these regions are being activated at the same time during rest when there is no external task to perform. These regions become deactivated when someone switches from rest to task performance, while other brain regions become activated in coordinated specific task networks or other sets of different areas of the brain will be activated at once to perform tasks. So the uh, DMN is involved in self-referential thought, in the mind wandering, in social awareness, in affective processing, and in goal-directed behavior. And this relative activation of the medial prefrontal cortex or the anterior node of the DMN caused by exercise in those with MECFS may represent what we call a decoupling from the posterior nodes of the uh, DMN and a loss of regulatory input. So as such, uh, exercise-induced uncoupling of the DMN may be a pathological consequence or even serve as a biomarker for the presence of post-exertional malaise, either now or perhaps when this is more readily available to our patients in the future. It's also uh, noted that there can be neurobiological activity in the dorsal midbrain that is different in those in PEM. So submaximal exercise has also been observed to create changes in activation in the dorsal midbrain during post-exercise cognitive workload testing. So essentially a memory task, a, a high concentration memory task is given after exercise to patients. And we see activation of the dorsal midbrain, whereas in controls, there is no activation in this region. And it's really interesting to consider that there are all kinds of nuclei in this uh, dorsal midbrain, particularly involved in the ascending arousal network. And uh, this part of the midbrain and the isthmus participate in things like threat assessment, awareness, attention, mood, concentration, pain, tenderness, sleep, thermoregulation, light and sound sensitivity, and autonomic functions, all symptoms that seem to be exacerbated during post-exertional malaise or be a part of the post-viral fatiguing illness um, presentation. So this is not meant to be a terribly crowded slide, but just to sort of show that dorsal midbrain and the various regions that are activated in those performing the memory task after exercise, um, and to just sort of touch on the different, uh, the motivation, the pain reception, uh, wakefulness, uh, whether someone is in sympathetic overdrive or not, how they're taking in auditory uh, processing, whether or not they get easily startled, all of these things are processed through this region and there is way more activation in this region um, in those patients. So to get away from some of that heavy uh, biology there. I hope that just drives home the idea that there are metabolic and neurobiological changes associated with post-exertional malaise that can be measured, even if they're not readily available to us in the clinical setting. So what about the clinical setting? Um, what are the implications of PEM? Well, it's important to remember that post-exertional malaise is perhaps the most debilitating and miserable aspect of ME-CFS and post-acute sequelae of COVID as an illness. And it has been long recognized by clinical providers who treat ME-CFS that continued and repeated episodes of post-exertional malaise within any one individual are associated or appear to be associated with a worsened long-term functional prognosis. You have lots of PEM, lots of repeated PEM or prolonged episodes of PEM over and over, the prognosis for function will be worse. So when patients choose to, or are spurred to push through their symptoms to the point of repeatedly inducing PEM, they may eventually experience a particularly severe prolonged episode of PEM. And this may be followed by a resetting of their baseline function. In other words, their PEM reduced function may now be their baseline function. And if they're to experience post-exertional malaise again, it'll be even worse uh, than, than it was before. So, this uh, idea of be mentally stronger than that which you phys physically feel, push through, that is, not the, uh, that is not the way we want to approach post-exertional malaise in these patients. That is wrong. 
So it's actually been postulated that the neurophysiological responses taking place during PEM that we touched on earlier may accrue over time. And as such, they may actually leave permanently altered function or injury to some of those neuronal networks upon exceeding some threshold that we're not aware of um, based on frequency intensity of these biological processes. And so I have over here this goofy guy with a stub toe because this is what I actually tell my patients. Think of a stub toe. If you stub your toe uh, every day you know, for the next two weeks on the, on the door jam, that toe is just not going to heal and it's going to get more and more swollen, more and more painful, and maybe the toenail is not going to grow back right. So in other words, you are stacking injury upon injury. Alternatively, if you stub your toe once every day, or sorry, once every week for the next 10 years, that toe is also not going to look the same as it did before. It's going to have long-term changes that eventually become irreversible and, and show chronic damage. And I think of PEM the same way. You want to stub your, if you do stub your toe, you want to give it enough time to heal before you stub it again, uh, or the, the, the consequences will be worse and will be additive. So how do we manage uh, post-exertional malaise? Well, it's not the most um, rewarding thing to think about, but we tell our patients pacing is the key. And in fact, at the Bateman Horn Center, we use the turtle as our mascot because slow and steady is actually what wins the race in this case. So there is nothing that definitively speeds up recovery from post-exertional malaise other than not making it worse, not digging a deeper hole, not continuing to fight or push through the limitations of this physiologically altered state. There is a, there's a problem with the physiology and trying to overcome that is a fool's errand. So forcing continued, repeated, and exertional exercise to combat an underlying decompensated state may seem logical, right? There's a lot of people that have proposed this, uh, but it only appears to promote worsened long-term outcomes in those who experience post-exertional malaise. So graded exercise therapy, uh, as was um, recommended by the NHS once upon a time, no, thank you. That is not the right way to go to help people avoid post-exertional malaise and to get better. It's just not effective. Uh, a patient does not manage their ME-CFS or their post-acute sequelae of COVID on the whole by fighting harder, but instead they need to be smarter and employ discipline and calculated intelligence to minimize the intensity and duration of PEM and to eventually try to space out more and more time between episodes or avoid post-exertional malaise altogether. There's this is the most important concept to understand about post-exertional malaise in any of these patients. So what should patients do? They should remember that cognitive exertion, even subconscious processing of sensory inputs and emotional exertion can be as damaging as physical exertion, right? People will say, hey, I stopped doing things. Well, if you're you know, reading all day or playing on your phone all day, you're still doing things. Even if you're sitting passively in a restaurant and there's all kinds of stuff going on around you, you may not be consciously processing all of that information, but your brain is using glucose to filter things out and, and assign salience to them. We ask patients to remain within what we call their energy envelope or their battery. And I like to say that everybody has an energy envelope. And that as we age, it gets a little smaller, but in people with ME-CFS, that's reduced significantly. And this is all the energy they have or all the money, as we talked about before, to spend in a day. And it takes some time to sort of learn those limits, but it's worth doing. And it's something we're always working with our patients to improve. Patients should take frequent restorative breaks. So if you are draining your battery, why not take a break and recharge it a little bit before you hit zero? We ask people to set timers during activities. And I think of a case that I saw um, when I initially started at Bateman Horn Center where a patient told me it was bad enough that I was so sick I couldn't work anymore, but I love to paint. And um, I got to the point where I'd only have one day where I felt okay enough to paint per month. So I'd sit there and I'd paint and I'd feel great. And a couple hours later, I would feel awful. And the next day I was back in that 29 day cycle of a crash right? Well, she started setting timers for activities and found out that if she limited herself to an hour and a half of painting in the morning and then rested the rest of the day, she woke up the next day not in post-exertional malaise and she could paint again. And she got to a point where she could actually do two hours in the morning, take a break, do some other things to sort of help restore her energy envelope, and then return to painting for an hour uh, in the evening. So she regained the ability to do something that was putting her into a crash by taking breaks and setting timers because it was easy to get carried away with feeling good when she was feeling good. 
Um, we ask people to modify activities to provide less physiological stress. And this is particularly important with individuals with orthostatic intolerance. So if you can do a task laying down, reclining with your legs elevated or even sitting as opposed to standing or bending over, it can make an enormous difference in the energy envelope. Showering is one of the biggest things that we notice this with in those who have orthostatic intolerance. So um, I tell people you don't have to get grandma's shower chair, but a nice teak shower chair that you might see in a Japanese spa sitting down to wash yourself can make an enormous difference. Um, plan a day's activities carefully and don't overfill any particular day. Trying to say, well, I'm out of the house, so I'm gonna knock out all these errands all today is just not going to work. Try to space those out, maybe give a recovery day in between for big activities uh, and plan those day's activities carefully. I tell people it's important to choose what's important use of their time and to challenge their assumptions of what has to be done. If someone is sick enough, do they really have to be employed? If all they can do is try to be employed, fail anyway, be sick and spend the rest of their life in PEM and recovery? Or is there more to life and do they deserve a chance to be able to socialize with family members and friends and have some semblance of, of happiness? Uh, is it important to make sure that you vacuum the house all the time? Or would you rather spend that time on the phone with a family member? It's important for people to kind of rethink about what their priorities are in this state um, so that they don't use up all their energy on things that don't really matter in the end. Um, setting voice reminders and lists on a phone can be really helpful. I know a lot of people will have a two-story home, go up the stairs, get to the top of the stairs, and then be like, oh, I forgot what I came up here for. And then they'll go down and they go back up again later. Setting a voice reminder on your phone before doing an exertional task like going upstairs and then listening to it later can help prevent multiple times up and down those stairs. I encourage people when they're financially capable to consider grocery home delivery services, home cleaning services, et cetera, so that they have that energy for something more important to them. And then this is really hard for me in my life, so I can only imagine it'd be hard for others to really learn to ask for help and to not feel like they're an invalid because they're asking for help. To start doing something and then say, hey, I'm not feeling quite great. I'm not sure if I've extended past my energy envelope. Can you help me finish this? Um, and learning to ask for help earlier and often will help keep people out of post-exertional malaise and doing better in the long run and uh, having stronger relationships with those that matter in their lives. We do use occasional off-label pharmacotherapy in and surrounding post-exertional malaise. Uh, one of those is low-dose naltrexone. We use 4.5 milligrams or less. This is known to modulate microglial cells through the toll-like receptor 4, and it can suppress activation of these microglial cells. Um, we don't fully know if that is modifying post-exertional malaise or not, though in some people it would appear to on the clinical side of things. We also use standard doses of dextromethorphan or the DM and Robitussin DM. to down. This is something that downregulates the cough reflex through sigma opioid receptors and can also act as an NMDA uh, antagonist. So it's possible that it downregulates other dorsal midbrain or PONS-related disordered autonomic reflexes that we touched on earlier. Um, although we're not, that, that's sort of the postulated mechanism. Certainly we've used it in patients uh, either directly before an exertional event or right after an exertional event. And in some people it clinically appears to help them prevent PEM or reduce the intensity and duration of their PEM. Um, so again, do we know fully why that is or why it's happening? Not quite, but it does appear to be relatively safe and well tolerated and sometimes efficacious in our patients. Again, all off label as you can see here. So uh, what do we need to watch out for as far as setbacks? Remember that if I give you a magical treatment for your post viral illness, um, you know, treatment B, and uh, this is a successful clinical, clinical intervention, I'm gonna feel, or my patient is gonna feel better with that treatment, right? So what are they gonna do? Being human, they feel better, they're going to wanna make up for lost time and start doing all the things they couldn't do when they felt bad now that they feel well. But maybe doing that, even though they feel well, still exceeds their energy envelope and puts them into post-exertional malaise. So in this instance, did my intervention actually help the patient or hurt them? Um, sometimes it's a little of both and it can be really a challenging task to understand you know, what an intervention is doing in these patients because of the impact of post-exertional malaise. So over time, the continued limitation of post-exertional malaise or even complete avoidance of, of post-exertional malaise does seem to lead to clinical symptom stability 
and gradual improvements in patients' energy envelopes over time so that they ultimately slowly but surely gain back a little bit of function without triggering PEM. That is my goal for patients and for the interventions I provide them in post viral illnesses it is all at the end of the day to help them stay out of PEM as much as possible. And this is really what leads to better functional outcomes and quality of life at the end of the day. And it's important to not lose track of that when we get bogged down in the minutia of managing orthostatic intolerance, mast cell activation, et cetera. So these are a few resources uh, on our BHC website, as well as at the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, which has an article about ME-CFS and post-viral illnesses with guidance on PEM, as well as many other aspects of the illness. And I wanna thank everybody for their time and attention.